Hi everybody, welcome to my video on strain and rheology in Earth's lithosphere. In this video, we're going to take a look at how stresses in Earth's lithosphere cause it to deform in different ways. For example, in the upper crust, we get brittle deformation, where the crust cracks and fractures along faults, much like the crusty surface of this creme brulee. But in lower parts of the lithosphere, we get what's called ductal deformation, where we get a fluid and continuous deformation, much like the creamy center of this creme brulee. And so why should you care about how the Earth deforms under different conditions? Well, understanding how this material deforms provides a key link between looking at the rock record and working backwards to infer the tectonic stresses that might explain the deformation we're seeing. So rheology explains everything from the structural style of rifts to the style of faulting and folding in mountain belts and to the pattern of strain and uh, earthquake recurrence in active tectonic belts. So I want to motivate this with a quick example. The San Andreas Fault, roughly going from San Francisco down to the Mexico border. The Pacific Plate is moving north, and the North American Plate is moving south along this strike-slip fault. And this fault penetrates to roughly 30 kilometers depth. However, if we look at the pattern of earthquakes along this fault, earthquakes only go to roughly 15 kilometers depth. And we see that here on this cross-section profile going from San Francisco uh, down towards Parkfield, California. And these black dots are earthquakes, which are entirely limited to the upper 15 kilometers of the fault zone. So if earthquakes are caused by the two plates moving past each, each other, and we know the fault extends to 30 kilometers depth, why are we only seeing earthquake in the upper 15 kilometers depth? And the reason is because there's a fundamental change in the rheology. Above 15 kilometers, strain is being accommodated in a brittle fashion by earthquakes, and below 15 kilometers, it's being accommodated in a ductal fashion by the slow fluid deformation of rocks. So in this video, I'm going to first introduce you to the three main types of strain, elastic, brittle, and ductile. And then we're going to look at how different rheologies determine the relationship between stress and strain, and thus how rocks deform. And then we'll finish by bringing it back to Earth's lithosphere and look at how rheology changes with depth in Earth. So first, Let's define strain. Strain is deformation. It's a change in shape of rock in response to stress. And two main types are volumetric, which is an expansion or dilation, and angular strain, which is essentially the motion of one particle laterally past another. And we also call angular strain shear. Here's a couple examples. These pumice clasts used to be circular, but they've been squished and also sheared laterally. So they've experienced both volumetric and angular strain. In contrast, here's a highway that's been offset during an earthquake on a strike-slip fault. This is an example of almost purely angular strain. And we can measure this by looking at how the angle between one point on this center line has changed relative to this point. And we always measure strain with what's called the strain rate. And this can take various forms, but it's essentially measured as the fractional change in size or in angle per time. So if the strain rate is faster, something is deforming more quickly. Now let's look at the three main types of strain, or the three ways that a rock can deform. These are elastic, brittle, and ductile. And we're going to go through these one by one. Elastic strain is a temporary deformation that occurs in response to stress. It's essentially when you squeeze something or when you stretch something. And then it returns to its original size once that stress is released. A good example is a spring. 
Here it is at its resting state. And then if we add a weight to it, we actually extend the spring. Its length increases, and we get a, a positive strain. But when we remove the spring, it goes right back to its original size. And so elastic strain is very transient. And interestingly, this is how energy is stored prior to earthquakes. As the crust gets squished and compressed, and then during the earthquake, it expands and releases that energy. Now, brittle strain occurs when the rock actually breaks, when you've pushed it too far, and we actually get a fracture within the rock. This is essentially permanent angular strain. The rock is broken, the blocks slip past each other, and we can never put them back. It's unrecoverable. And this is very common in the upper crust, where rocks break along faults. Here's an example of a huge fault scarp that cut up through Earth's surface during an earthquake. And you can see that literally rocks on either side have been broken and offset from each other in a brittle failure. The third example is ductile strain. This is when rocks are deformed in a fluid, continuous manner. This can take the form of either angular or volumetric strain. And interestingly, it occurs by solid state recrystallization. Nothing actually breaks. Literally, bonds are just reconfigured. And we'll talk more about that later in the video. So now that you're familiar with the three types of strain, let's talk about how rheology dictates the stress-strain relationship in each of these cases. And we'll start with elastic strain. We can think of elastic strain much like a spring that's either stiff or weak. And you, you might know that a stiff string, a stiff spring, takes more stress to compress than a soft spring. And that kind of stiffness or elasticity is defined by Young's modulus, which is essentially a parameter that relates uh, differential stress to the amount of strain that's accumulated. When Young's modulus is small, we get a lot of strain for a little stress. When it's big, we get a small amount of strain. Okay, And we can essentially think of this as how easy is it to stretch a rubber band versus how easily might it be to stretch a tire on a car, for example. So now, one thing to appreciate is that elastic strain, all, all deformation pretty much starts as elastic. And when you push a material too far, it may then break. And it can break in a brittle failure mechanism. And that will occur when the brittle yield strength is exceeded. And that's essentially the differential stress at which permanent deformation occurs. So looking at that same example, you can see that we will first incur elastic deformation up until we reach the yield strength. That's the stress at which the rock breaks. And then we undergo unrecoverable strain. So why does an increase in differential stress make failure more likely? Well, in a previous video, we talked about the idea that differential stress is basically the difference between the smallest and the biggest principal stresses. And as that difference gets bigger, you essentially always have one orientation in which stress is really high relative to the others. And what that means is that you could have a potential failure plane in some arbitrary orientation in which the state of stress can be resolved into a very high shear stress and a relatively low normal stress. So essentially, as differential stress increases, there's some potential failure plane where the shear stress is getting really, really high. And so what combination of shear stress and normal stress do we need to cause failure? That's predicted by what's called Byerly's law, or the Moore-Coulomb failure relationship. And that's shown here as a plot of normal stress versus shear stress on some arbitrary fracture plane. Okay? And all these dots show experimental data for some material. These dots show when 
what stress conditions caused that material to fail. Okay? And if you fit a line through these, you get a failure envelope, essentially. If you're down here, below that line, you're in the safety zone. You're in a place where normal stress is relatively high relative to shear stress. And that means that your, your fracture plane is unlikely to fail. So here's a, a point that's in the safety zone. It's not going to break. But as we ramp up differential stress, and thus we ramp up shear stress on some plane, that, that starts to increase, and we move vertically upward, and eventually we're going to cross this failure line. Okay, And then our material is going to break. So the slope and the intercept of this line, i.e. the conditions at which failure occurs, are predicted by a few parameters. So for example, S0 is the cohesive strength of the material. That's essentially the shear stress required to break the material if there's no normal stress at all. And you might imagine that something like a granite has a higher cohesive strength than something like a sandstone. And the same with the coefficient of friction, which defines the slope of this line. The steeper this line is, in general, the more shear stress uh, you need to break something. So that now that you know what controls brittle deformation, let's take a look at what controls ductile deformation, or ductile strain. This is a totally different beast. Ductile strain occurs by solid state recrystallization at very high temperatures. Essentially, as you heat a rock and as you stress a rock, new minerals recrystallize during metamorphism. So you might go from something like a shale and then under heat and pressure, turn that in to a gneiss. And as those minerals are recrystallizing, the pattern of mineral growth is essentially controlled by the stress field. And for example, in this gneiss, you might imagine there was some kind of a shear stress going like this that was causing the minerals to kind of grow laterally and spread themselves out into these stringy bands. And so if you have a lot of shear going on and you have minerals kind of continuously growing laterally, rocks can essentially start to flow and actually material can actually move over time. And so how are this, is this accomplished on the molecular scale? Uh, it turns out this is very complicated. Uh, it's different for different materials and very much a subject of, of active study in material science. But in general, we can say that ductile deformation occurs by a family of what are called creep processes. Uh, and here's an example, which is called dislocation creep. Here we have a mineral structure with a shear applied across it. And you can see that the lattice gets sheared, and then eventually one bond breaks, and then the bonds reestablish themselves. But this whole upper block has been translated laterally. And so this is an example of how without melting the material and without breaking it, you can actually cause it to deform over time. And for our purposes, one of the key ideas about creep is that it's driven by temperature, applied stress, and by crystal structure. And so in particular, different rock types are going to deform ductally at very different temperatures uh, due to their different crystal structures. And so when do materials start to deform ductally? Well, we can quantify the rate of ductal strain using what's called a power law creep equation. And as it turns out, there's no specific point when ductile strain starts, but we can imagine points when the strain rate exceeds some kind of meaningful rate, where it essentially kind of goes from unnoticeable or zero up to some noticeable strain rate. And so strain rate is formulated using this power law relationship that describes the thermally activated creep processes and here's what it looks like. Strain rate is equal to some constant that's unique to the material times the differential stress taken to a stress exponent that's unique to the material times the exponential function 
of the activation energy that's unique to the material times the stress exponent, gas constant, and then the all-important temperature. And so essentially what we see here is that both material properties matter, but that everything is ultimately governed by, by temperature, which is sitting here in the exp exponential part of the equation. So let's briefly summarize brittle versus ductile strain. In terms of strain rate, ductile occurs very slowly over a million year time scales, whereas brittle occurs very quickly, such as when an earthquake fault breaks. In terms of duration, ductile strain persists as long as there's a stress. So ductile strain will keep going forever as long as there's stress, whereas brittle deformation pretty much stops once the fracture has slipped and broken. And because that, that slip often reduces the stress, brittle deformation doesn't typically go on for very long. In terms of strain recovery, both are permanent, unrecoverable modes of deformation, whereas elastic is recoverable. And then in terms of kind of controlling factors, ductile is strongly controlled by temperature and crystal structure, and of course also by stress. In contrast, brittle deformation is less sensitive to temperature and is very sensitive to the material strength properties and also to the stress state, such as the shear stress and normal stress on a given slip plane. All right, so now I'd like to wind down this video by bringing things back to how rheology controls deformation within Earth. And so keep in mind that the lithosphere is made up of a variety of different rock types that are all going to have different rheologies. And this is most apparent when we think about ductile deformation, where we know that strain rate is controlled by all these material-specific parameters, like A and N and E. And if you look at those in this table here, you can see that, for example, something in the upper crust, like a granite, has a much lower activation energy than, for example, peridotite in the lithospheric mantle, which has a five times higher activation energy. And so what that means is that granite in the upper crust is going to start to flow ductally at a much lower temperature than peridotite in the lithospheric mantle and they're going to have very different uh, deformation rheologies. And so that idea is summarized, and this entire video is summarized by this figure. And what this figure shows is depth, or temperature, down into Earth's lithosphere. And then on the, the x-axis is the differential stress required to reach either the brittle or ductile yield point, whichever is lower. Okay, So essentially, this plot shows the stress required to deform or break the rock as a function of depth. And what we see here is that in the upper 15 kilometers, the yield strength is entirely controlled by brittle failure. So in other words, if you stress the rock, it breaks first in a brittle fracture. But then as we come into the lower crust, we get into uh, a ductile flow regime, where the ductile yield strength is now lower than the brittle yield strength. And of course, that's because ductile deformation is heavily controlled by temperature. So as we ramp up temperature with depth, we see that suddenly, at about 15 kilometers, the ductile yield strength gets lower than the brittle yield strength, right into here. And then as we come now, down into some compositional jumps. For example, as we jump into the lithospheric mantle, we see that that peridotite uh, does not flow as easily, so we get a big jump in ductile yield strength as we go into a different rock type. And it's hard to overstate the importance of this strength profile. It essentially dictates where the lithosphere is weakest and where it's likely to deform under a stress which totally dictates the pattern of tectonic deformation. And so to close this video, let's bring it back to our San Andreas Fault example. Remember that we only saw earthquakes in the upper 10 to 15 kilometers. And now we understand that that transition 
is literally the transition at which we go from a brittle failure regime into a ductal failure regime. That's what explains the brittle to ductal transition, and that's why we don't have earthquakes below 15 kilometers, because everything's deforming ductally at depth. So in summary, strain is deformation in response to an applied stress. Strain can occur either by a volume change or by an angular offset that's called shear. There's three basic types of strain, elastic, brittle, and ductile. And they each have different relationships that relate stress to strain. Elastic strain is governed by Young's modulus and the elasticity. Brittle strain is governed by Byerly's law or the kind of material properties. And ductile strain is governed by a power law equation that essentially describes molecular creep processes. Regardless of these, as differential stress rises, rocks are going to deform by whichever type of strain has the lowest yield strength at that given pressure and temperature. Sometimes that's brittle, sometimes that's ductile. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in class.